Okay. <clears throat> Last class, I waxed eloquent way ahead of what I should have been sharing, but I just got carried away. I really did. I got carried away. I totally enjoyed myself, but it was not good. I mean, I just went and covered all kind of ground ahead of other stuff. <clears throat> so at least this class, um, we let me, before you turn there, because we're not going to start there, we were in Romans 6, and we were, I mean, uh, uh, Revelation 6, and comparing it to Romans 8, and in that comparison, we were finding Paul literally describing his his book of Revelation experience, basically. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it's not just his, but all of ours. And so we took the time and I charted it on the board and we, we compared um, Romans 8 and the afflictions, you know, that he mentioned there. And we found out that a bunch of them lined up with what Romans, I mean, Revelation 6 was talking about. Many of them being the same exact things <clears throat> that Paul was saying we just go through because of that we are made sheep for the slaughter. And um, <clears throat> so I did jump ahead a little bit into Revelation 7, but I'd like to kind of try to finish off. Uh, I've only got one paragraph. It's a long one. But um, <clears throat> out of Romans 8, so let's start there and re remembering that this actually is an explanation of Revelation 6 and many of the seals that were presented there. All right, it is um, Romans 8. <clears throat> um, verse 35, starting at verse 35, and we'll just finish it out. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And those were the ones that we compared to Revelation 6 and found that they were pretty much a match. Um, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And so he is saying that the things that Revelation 6 are talking about are nothing more than us being accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, by the lamb, and we'll, we'll explain that a little more, although you should have already caught on to that. Um, <clears throat> verse 37, nay, and all these things, and there it is, most people read this, nay, no, we're not going to be sheep for the slaughter. But it says, nay, in all of these things, we're not just slaughtered sheep. That we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And the him that loved us is, how does he love us? By this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And that's how you perceive the love of God. That he, by him that loved us, we are more than conquerors through what he did selflessly, and we are accounted in that same thing as sheep for the slaughter in that same spirit, but not in some sort of a defeatist mentality, but more than conquerors. And he does, so he doesn't call us conquerors because a conqueror would defeat something, but in reality, what he's describing is something that actually gets defeated and conquers by death, Christ the way that he did it at the cross. And then he says, um, <clears throat> verse 38, for I am persuaded, and this, is, this must become our persuasion. Uh, we must become persuaded, not just believe, you know, academically or, but we must be persuaded by the Holy Spirit and by the word and by the, by the truth 
um, that, and, and may I say this before I read persecution, you know, all the stuff that's fixing to say here. Uh, <clears throat> may I say that there may be people in this room or watching on Skype that thinks they're persuaded, but they're not persuaded because when this stuff comes up, we react as if we don't understand this and you know you know and so i'm not saying that with condemnation and i don't think the lord would the lord would just say using paul we must be persuaded and we must be persuaded where we can we could we can sit right here today and experience all of the things listed in revelation 6 and still be persuaded uh, uh, romans 8 also but but the, set, uh, the seals are thrust into, quote unquote, the end times experience and all of those things and still be persuaded that this route of being accounted as sheep for the slaughter, this route of being killed all the day long, <clears throat> and the truth is if we're not doing that now, we're not going to do it in some sort of a apocalyptic <laughs> nightmare it ain't gonna happen <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> so if we're going oh no oh, that you know that that splinter hurt me from the cross you know and he's going you need to die on the thing quit crying over splinters from just touching it and um and to, and to truly i i don't i can't express it to truly comprehend that that the the worst scenarios the worst scenario the, and you know <clears throat> we're you know we're nothing near the worst scenarios our little problems in life and somebody thought he better me or this oh my god that's that's on a petty level that's just pettiness but this this ability to see not this stuff and you and your face, you know. Didn't God tell Jeremiah, don't pay any attention to their faces. Look not on their faces. Go with me. You know, well, what, then what do we do? We look on his face and we're changed into that same image. And, and so when, when this stuff comes, there is no reason at all that we should be so easily tripped up freaked out um, uh, so focused on something that is controlling our mind and emotions throughout our day because we're just replaying it over and over and over again instead of breaking that with the cross and the cross will do it you know someone says well I've been at this for years I've been listening to you and it hadn't done it for me well, it doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it won't work. It doesn't mean it's not the power of God. It means that we're the weakness of God you know, in a bad way. You know, we're stopping up the flow. So I, you know, I, uh, I and, and let me just say, I don't say these things because of, as if I have anything, because the only thing I do have is the Lord. That's all I got. I don't got... I don't have me in the sense of um, any hope of victory or any uh, great stance with the Lord. All I have is the Lord, and I must depend. See, I must depend on the Lord. I must. I must. Because if I don't, I shoot right down the tubes. So I'm going to stay with the Lord. It's my only hope, and Christ in me. This is my only hope, and um, and that's that's deeper and more real than you can know. But um, but I just say it, lest anybody should think me above that which I am. Um, and as if by saying these things that you know. I'm somebody that's, whether I have this working in me or not, is still not attributed to me. And if I don't have it, it it's still a need that I, I need. 
I don't even know. I'm just trying to communicate something that is deep within me that I desire to communicate and don't think I can properly say it. So he says, <clears throat> For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, we, we hit on that last couple of classes, that the love of God here is not some sort of a, you know, warm, fuzzy, whatever, that we will not be separated from God's love because God is love and he, he expresses his love this way. And if we're going through all this as sheep for the slaughter, then we cannot possibly be separated from that. We're one with it. My God. So I'm going to read this, and it goes along these lines. The sufferings which are brought about strictly because one has set himself to live as a sheep for the slaughter, for the benefit of others, sees his suffering as a joint participation with Christ and him crucified, and not of God's rejection or withdrawal from us. I'm persuaded. This, this stuff is not, I mean, that stuff can separate you from God, but, it, but in the most real sense, it can't separate you from his love because his love is bought and paid for you. But you can separate from him in just seeing life constantly as an earth being instead of as a son of God by Christ. I mean, we, you know, what's the point of being born again? Oh, well, at least I'm not going to hell. Okay, you got that. I'll give that to you. Praise God. I won't argue with you. You know, I just don't want to see you in heaven. Not really. I'm joking. I'm, I'm sorry. Some of this Texas stuff slips out now. And I shouldn't be letting it. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So, so I said, uh, um, they see his sufferings that we're going through as a joint participation with Christ. Whatever you're going through is seen as a joint participation with Christ and him crucified. Um, Still in the eighth chapter, just one page the other direction, eight, uh, 817. <clears throat> and if children, then heirs, there's your joint participation, heirs of God and joint heirs with, with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. All right, so... Here is that joint participation that it's calling for. See, we're going, well, I'm one with Jesus. I mean, that's our joint participation. I'm one with Jesus. Do you even know what one with Jesus means? Don't be saying that. <laughs> Don't say you're one with Jesus unless you're one with him in his sufferings and you understand uh, my place God has accounted me as sheep for the slaughter. We say, those people, they've just accounted me as nothing but sheep for the slaughter. No, God has counted you that by Christ. It's one of the highest privileges that he can do to account you as participating with the lamb in that nature and therefore able to handle things by Christ crucified, by the lamb. My God, of all of the things that he could have called you. You know, well, you are my treasured Christian. Is that what you want to hear? <laughs> you are my treasured Christian. Or you are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, just like I was. And we're going to go through this together because this is a joint participation. And you're heirs yeah, of this. This is what you become heir of. It's in the same sentence. He's talking about being heirs. He doesn't say, and you're going to get the gold, or you're going to get the top mansion in glory. You know. In fact, in fact, if so be that you suffer with him, that we may also be 
Glorified. What does that mean? Glorified. We, what, is it, what concepts have we built around glorified? To not comprehend that the greatest glory comes from God because we have become a joint participant of this lamb nature and have proven it by going through this stuff. If so be we suffer with him, then glorified. You see, not, not just, not, let me see if I wrote something here. Glorified equals God's word for honor he gives for what gave itself by Christ crucified. Compare John 12, 24. Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now. This is, a, this is at the end of three and a half years of ministry, Jesus is saying this. He's saying that he hasn't, that there has been no true glory because he hadn't given himself as a lamb for the slaughter. There's no glory yet. Well, what about the time he fed all them 5,000? He's not, he doesn't, because that's not glory from the Father that comes through selfless giving, through lamb nature. You avoid the lamb nature, and it doesn't matter what you've done. So, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? No, now, this is the first time I'm going to truly be glorified because I'm going through death for others to an extreme level. You should be glorified if you suffer with him. See, there is no, he doesn't say you'll be glorified if you're saved and then you die and you go to heaven. I mean, think it, come on, let's, let's, let's get the Christian thought compared to his thought, which is called the word of God. And the Christian thought is, well, I'm going to be glorified when I die and simply die physically. Just your heart just stops beating and you go, you know, and it goes, okay, I'm going to be glorified. Now, just because my ticker couldn't go any further. Really? Okay. Well, no, my ticker stopped, but I'm going to be glorified because of all of the good stuff I did for God. The many hours of prayer all of my involvements in ministry, all of the people I prayed for and they got healed, all of the people that we fed in the soup kitchen, all of, Jesus did all of that stuff, didn't he? And he says, I'm not even, he goes, now, now that we're talking about the cross and I'm just about there, this is where the glory is going to come from. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. Okay, so I hope you see that. I hope you see that, that there is a contrast, that this verse is pretty powerful. I mean, we sure read through it quick, usually when we're reading here in Romans 8, because there's better scriptures than this one. But that, you know, we, we read the top part. We are heirs. Yeah, we're heirs. But then he just says, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. And he, he is clearly saying that if there, you're suffering with him, this is the sufferings of Christ. This is the same thing that Paul talked about when he said um, that I may know him. Okay? Well, we say, we always focus on, you know, the power of his resurrection, but it didn't say the power of resurrection, and it didn't say resurrection power. Those are wrong words. Those are Christian words. It says the power of his resurrection, whereby we were raised up because he died. So I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, and I want to be made conformable. One is I want to know him in sufferings and so that I'm one with where his mind is on this stuff. And then the other one is that I want to be made conformable to that spirit I'm knowing of him in how he gave, because it's his sufferings at that point, know him in the 
in his sufferings, and then I see in his sufferings, I see the cross, I see the lamb, I see the nature, I see the beauty, and I, in seeing that, I want to conform to him, to that. I want to be a joint participant. I want to be an heir. I want to, I want to suffer with him because I'm conformed to it and not just fellowship with him in what he did. You might see the difference there. Two different things. One leads to the other and there is this there's meant to be this drawing, this drawing, and see, to truly, I mean, you know, to truly see him lifted up in this spirit and in this manner will draw all men to him, not to church. And when we understand the spirit behind, the nature behind this ability, this strength to die, this strength to suffer loss, this strength to be small or hidden, this strength to take the lower seat and realize it's, my God, it's the higher seat, and I was always scratching and clawing to get up there. That's what he means. That'll, if you see that, that, that has a magnetic power to draw me to, number one, fellowship in his way of suffering, which his way is by his nature. And number two, to be made, see, we call it, we, we always talk about being made one or I do, and I do because it's being made conformable. It's not just some magical, okay, now we're one. Right? I mean, isn't that true? I mean, it's really not just, just you know, okay, I'm just one, you know, and I'm an idiot, and you're, you're the lamb or something, you know, but we're one. You know, I may be an idiot. I may be. But I want to be made conformable. Okay, you say, well, you're an idiot because you're going to die. <laughs> I'm a fool for Christ. I'm also a sucker for him. I sucker for the lamb. I am. I admit it. I admit it. I admit it. All right, so my God, am I ever going to read anything other than, anyway, so I'm still reading this one paragraph. Um, Well, after I said that, I said, he considers nothing else true glory. <clears throat> I wish that we could do that. Don't you wish that? That we could consider nothing else glory. No ministry, no um, thing that we've done or said or prayed or got involved with glory until there is a joint participation of suffering and death with him in that and not be afraid of uh, um, persecution or, or uh, death or life nor angels nor principalities nor power nor any of those things or they go back up here uh, tribulation or distress this is more akin to actual living right now this, this should hit home more tribulation or persecution or distress should not separate us from this selfless way. It should prove us. Hence, excuse me, Book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. In other words, suffering is not revealing the absence of God, but the presence of God in you as you bear about his dying. It's not, it's not revealing all this stuff. You know, where's God? See, 
only, you know, we say the concentration camp. You know, we talk about that. Where is God? Well, Betsy wasn't saying, where is God? She got, she has him in her, and she's bringing it. <laughs> Bring it, girl. She is bringing it. And she's not, she's not complaining. She's not going, these stupid Nazis and all the bad stuff they're doing and stress and distress and tribulation and persecution, you know, you know, or where's God? Why is this so bad or whatever? She's, she's going, this is great. I mean, she's pointing to everything from the fleas to anything else. This is our opportunity to show Christ. To let him be manifested through us in all of these things. We're more than conquerors. Okay. So how many in all the concentration, you know, we go three million, I don't know, isn't it three million, six million, I don't know. Something like that. It's more than one million. Uh, died in the Holocaust. How many of those showed forth Christ crucified? How many of them were joint participators in the, in the sufferings of Christ? I don't know. You don't know. We don't know. But it begs the question, how many of us are, and we're not in concentration camps? So, you know, Paul, I appreciate him. He, you know, not as though I have attained or, or you know, his, his view was always... Um, I want to know, I want to know you, not, you know, uh, I want to know you. Uh, I want to be made conformable. It, it, it doesn't matter, in, in truth, in this absolute truth, it doesn't matter what you've lived up to this day. You can start today and you can set your heart and your goal to be with Jesus the way he'd like for you to be with him so that in the end, it's so one, it's more than one, it's wife of the lamb, for God's sake. Woo! And you just love him through the process and say, I just want to be with you. You're not going, well, you, you go die, you know, a little bit of Song of Solomon there. No, no you go, <laughs> and, and I'll just stay behind my windows, you know, in my wall. Um, no, no, I mean, I love you and I want to be with you. And I don't just want to be with you. What's that song I wrote that you used to sing? The Lord is my shepherd and I, I think I love him most. In other words, going through stuff, horrible, terrible stuff, and still being with the Lord because this is what you're called to and, and privileged to. And if, and here's the deal, here's the deal. I don't suggest this for anybody unless you're letting this mind be in you and then you want it. And if you're not, go ahead and squeal like a rat caught in a <laughs> trap. Because <clears throat> that's what you're going to do anyway. You know, it is ridiculous for me or anybody else to try to teach you to stop squealing while the pressure's on. You know, I can't even get to the cheese. I have this thing right in the middle of my back. My back. My back. <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, there's no need for me saying so. I, it's stupid to try to talk you into this. You would be, you know, and here's the here's the good thing. You would be better off in a one of them big old mega churches where they're teaching you can have anything you want. And just go for it and just jump in it like a big bowl of jello and swim around because you're not going to drown. You know, not going to die in this thing, in this jello. <laughs> it's not going to separate me because I'm going to stay happy. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just mean. 
Uh, yeah. You know, and here's the deal. It really is crazy. I mean, I, I even read over my notes here in the book of Revelation, and I just go, you're insane. You've finally done it. <laughs> you finally, you were on the fence for a long time, and then you flipped on over the crazy side. And I believe, I believe that if like this, this ever got compiled as a book and put on the web, I believe there would be people that would go after me like crazy. You know, which would be, which is not what I want. I don't want persecution or distress. Or, you know, I'm trying to avoid it. That's why I try to say it in a way that won't offend. <laughs> and so I rest my case. This is, you know, if, if, if this is the truth and it must be said, and we, we, we have gathered because we want and desire to hear it and eventually to get fully in us and then eventually to manifest so that we're with Jesus in this way, how should they hear without a preacher? It must be said. It has to be. Yes? You know, sometimes I feel crazy when the carnal mind's being confronted. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just in its full force, in its wisdom, in its way, and confronting the reality of the word and you got that clash going on the inside, but mm -hmm. you know, John says in his epistle, the whole world lieth in the wicked one. And I mean, the deception of the carnal mind is complete. Right. I mean, there isn't anything in us that can get this. Mm -hmm. There isn't any, we are complete, it's, it's a complete darkness with nothing in us. And it really, it, that's why it feels crazy. Right. That's why it feels crazy. Right. <clears throat> well, and in a very real way, I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, and I've probably said it before, but maybe not. It, it really is insanity to the carnal and natural mind, because that's a mind that is stable in this world and in, in this realm. It, it is. And this mind, if not comprehended as being from another realm, is just somebody that's just off their rocker. I mean, why would, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, I've said this before, but this, okay, this is me up here. Y'all see me? This is me. I, I don't particularly like people talking bad about me or stuff going on. I don't, I don't, you know, it's not like I'm going, oh, I love this, you know. <laughs> I don't. I, I, it's, it's hurtful. I'm human. Um, but... I have a choice. I can either respond and stay there or I can get with the Lord. And I want to be with the Lord. And you know, I mean, I have found out, and I'm sure most of y'all have too, but if you haven't, I have found out that it, you know, me and Jesus are a majority. <laughs> you know, I mean, I found that out and it, it works for me. It works for me. I don't have to. I used to have to have the approval of everybody. It would hurt me if one person didn't like me. Really, this was, this was, while I was in the ministry, I was that way. And it was just like, you know, somebody would express something where they didn't like me or something like that. I'd go, oh, I walk around all day like a cripple, you know. Oh, oh God, I'm trying to you know, reach everybody. And, and I did. It was pitiful. It was ugly but but um but the lord said to me one time he says so this is pretty rough huh yeah you know he goes yeah you so you got one person that doesn't like you what <laughs> what you got one person that really doesn't like you and you can't take that well yeah I, you know you, you know you yeah yeah, I'm going to toughen up right now, you know. <clears throat> it was pitiful. I mean, it was. It was. And, and I saw myself one day, we're driving down the road, and I was driving, and I saw myself as having no backbone at all. And it, and this is after several years of being that, the way I was. And I just saw it. I don't know how. I just, the Holy Spirit. But I mean, I saw it. And I just, 
it was so abhorrent to me and so ugly that I said, God, I cannot live this way. I do, do not want to be this way anymore. I want to be with you. Even if everybody turns against me. And he said, okay, we can fix that. <clears throat> Just like you and Jesus, me and Jesus are a majority. And if I, you know, if I, if I don't know where I stand, if I really don't know that I'm with the Lord, then that's just a fake. But if I know that I'm with the Lord, I know I can go through anything. And I know you're probably the same way. As long as you know it's the Lord, get out of my way. I can, I can be with it. That's why we need to keep, see, Paul said, knowing this. The old man is crucified, knowing this. And he keeps going there in Romans 6. That was before all of Romans 8 that we just read. And that's why he's as strong as he is in Romans 8. You see that? Because he went through Romans 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, up to 8. <clears throat> all right, let me try to finish this little part here. Um, in other words, suffering is not revealing the absence of God, but the presence of God in you as you bear about his dying. See, that's the deal. We're wanting, we're, we're freaked out. We're going through stuff and we're wanting, where's God? He's supposed to be in you bearing this by his nature. See, but we're wanting him to come along and feel his hand and go, oh, <laughs> there it is. Okay. I'll go through this for a year. You know, and it's all, you know, he's wanting to live in you. That's where the presence of God's supposed to be anyway. In that, in all of these things, we're more than conquerors. Paul singing in prison, and then you see not the deliverance of himself, but the resurrection of the jailer. See, see, this is the way Paul sees. This is the way Jesus sees. This is the way God sees. They get in that situation, they're not going, this is wrong. My God, could we just pray right now that every time something in us rises up and looks at something like that and goes, this is wrong, that, that the Spirit of God will just slap us right now. Every time. You, you up for that? You want to just pray that? Some of you don't seem convinced. <laughs> well, could he just could he just be a still small voice? Just a little reminder that this is not okay. <laughs> All right. However, I have prayed stuff like that, and he to this day, whoa, he I unleashed the kraken, and the Holy Spirit is faithful. And I, I've grown to love it now. You know what I mean? I really have. I've grown to love it. But you got to be careful what you pray. So I'm not going to pray something like that for you. You, you pray it if you feel anything. Um, <clears throat> Paul experienced a life with God that manifested the life of God. Hmm? Paul experienced a life with God that manifested the life of God in selfless giving in accord with the crucified one. This is, this is the way he experienced the life of God. This is the way. Any, didn't didn't y'all see something? Didn't somebody here see something about the image of God being the slaughtered lamb? Nobody? The presence of God that he manifested was Christ crucified. This is the presence of God he brought. Oh, my, my, my. It was not Paul imitating the cross, but the fact of him bearing about in his body that of Christ crucified. In this way, Christ crucified was not merely a symbol of selflessness, which we look at the cross as. You know, somebody says, why are you wearing that gold cross around your neck? That's an idol. Shouldn't be wearing idols. And you say, 
this is a symbol of selflessness. The cross is more than a symbol of selflessness. <clears throat> um, in this way, Christ crucified, because he manifested this, was not merely a symbol of selflessness, but the means by which to live selflessly. See, instead of saying this is a symbol of selflessness, say this is not the cross that I hope that you'll see. I hope you'll see Christ crucified through me. And I'm not putting down crosses, and I'm, I'm not saying they're idols unless you don't want to give them to me. Then if you don't, they're probably an idol. If it's gold, you probably should give it to me. Just kidding. Cut this part from the, from the record. Strike that from the record. Okay. <clears throat> Back to um, Revelation chapter 6. All right. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the um, book of Revelation has a lot of symbolism that is similar to the book of Exodus. And maybe you knew that, and maybe you didn't. But um, the uh, I'll explain this shortly, but I'll just say it now. Uh, the book of uh, Revelation is the true Exodus. The other one was a shadow. <clears throat> now, we know that the cross is the impetus of that, and I explained this pretty early on this semester, but I'll give you a quick explanation here in a minute. <clears throat> uh, there is an Exodus that takes place. And it's not just out of Babylon, it's out of ourselves and the way that we are apart from Christ. And I'll explain that as we go here. Um, there's also a similarity of plagues that were in the book of Exodus when they were delivered from Egypt. And um, so let's, let me just see if I can, because uh, I don't want to read all of this, but... <clears throat> Uh, I'll just say, there's a parallel, and I've got the scriptures here, but there's a parallel between Revelation and Exodus. Both are carried away on eagles' wings. Um, another similarity in the Old Testament has to do with God's wrath. Revelation 16, 19, and also Revelation 14, 18 talks about drinking of the wine cup of the fury of his wrath and from the wine press, and this is confirmed also uh, in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. <coughs> <clears throat> and here's one of the main ones I wanted to mention, though. When brought through the Red Sea, Israel sang a specific song. And we see parts of that song in Revelation 15, 2 through 4. Okay. But Revelation has an added part to the song that they didn't sing that they failed to sing, that they missed in singing, and that was they sang the Song of Moses, book of Revelation here, chapter, what did I say it was? Thank you, 15. Uh, two through four. They saw, sang the Song of Moses and of the Lamb. This is the true. This is the true Exodus because they're going to do. They're going to get the thing. Okay, they're going to get it. All right. <clears throat> so verse two tells us that these are the ones who got the victory over the beast. It is a very specific. Uh, it's very specific. The victory was over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. And they stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. The only way to not take the mark is to die. And I showed that in the last time I taught the book of Revelation from these scriptures. So I'm not going to go back over that and show the scriptures that prove that. <clears throat> um, they got the victory through death. That's why they sang of redemption through the Lamb. Those who sang the song in Exodus 15, 1 through 21, were supposed to have understood what happened at the Passover. And to have sang 
this song as the followers of the Lamb and not merely as a redeemed people. But they sang the song of Moses. They sang the song of redemption. And they didn't add the, the lamb because the lamb was there and they missed it. And they didn't see that as the um, true deliverance and deliverer. <coughs> Let's see. I almost skipped this part. Okay, there are similarities of, of plagues, and this doesn't just include the seals, but all the way through, um, because, uh, because the plagues in Egypt were toward a specific end, a, a particular specific end that God mentions in the New Testament. And um, so the plagues... Uh, and that end wasn't reached as proved by the song that they sang. Okay, in Exodus. The book of Revelation all the way through has much of the same plagues. I mean, uh, I've probably got a list here, but, you know, water turning to blood and stuff only it was way worse in the end because it's trying to really now this is it if you don't get the lamb out of this it's over with you know so there was uh the plagues of revelation are so similar to egypt but greater in exodus the river turns to blood but in revelation the whole ocean also universally across the world is darkness and locusts and frogs and hail and and uh, such like. <clears throat> uh, so in Exodus, the plagues are also meant to show Pharaoh's, so sh to show Pharaoh God's power. To show Pharaoh God's power. All right, back to Romans, but this time Romans nine. Romans 9 and verse 17. <clears throat> for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee that, that my name might be de declared throughout all the earth. <clears throat> I dealt with this also in that last Revelation class more in depth, but I want to show you because we're comparing the book of Revelation with Exodus, I want to show you um, how important this is. Uh, the, the plagues did not deliver Israel from Egypt. Therefore, that wasn't God's power. Amen? The plagues didn't deliver Israel out of Egypt. All of them were done, and, and even when he said, okay, you can go, he'd change his mind and keep them back. It wasn't until there was a slain lamb. Okay. So God was trying to show in Exodus, which is a type and shadow of the book of Revelation, he was trying to show in Exodus God's power, because it says so right here in the New Testament. But we... He does, since he doesn't say, oh, the power of God is the cross or Christ crucified or the lamb, because, he, right here, he, like we, he has to say it to us in every verse so that we remember it and see it. Instead of just going, you know what? Uh, the only thing got him out was the slain lamb. And they didn't go out and sing the song of redemption and of the lamb. So they didn't even really see the power of God. <clears throat> um, now let me read this because I'm not sure. The plagues were not the power that God wanted to impress Pharaoh with. They were not the power that would convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. Egypt saw his power as the slain lamb. When that, slam, that lamb died and was slain, they were ready to let him go. <clears throat> Then Pharaoh released them. So 
in the book of Revelation. Maybe I've got it written here. Let me just say this. In the book of Revelation, the revelation of the Lamb is not the book of Revelation, not Revelations, the book of Revelation, or first verse, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the, the revelation that the book of Revelation is trying to reveal is similar to Exodus, right? Yeah. The Lamb, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I hope you know that. Yeah. Okay, but it's not the lamb on the throne that he's trying to reveal. It's the lamb through his people over and over, chapter after chapter, giving themselves unto death and then watching the view leave the earth as soon as they do that and go up to the rejoicing and the glory that goes to the Lamb on the throne because he's glorified in death and because of death, both. So, let's just say that all of us who've been in two semesters of Book of Revelation have thought that the the big revelation of the lamb was the lamb on the throne. <clears throat> or let's say that this is the first time you really heard this. But remember, uh, one of my first classes, I stood up here and I, draw, I drew a big old chart and it was cool and it's absolutely worthless unless we see what it is. And I had over here the Old Testament and Jesus on the cross and then over here the book of Revelation. And underneath it, the Old Testament, I said, Jesus, the Lamb, was revealed in the Old Testament through the sacrifices. And this is a shadow, but this is where he's revealed. Anybody remember that part? And then we went to the middle part, and it was Jesus, and it was Christ crucified. And we said, this is the manifestation of the Lamb in himself for the world. But it was him. It was, he, it was all about him, the New Testament. Is all about his death for us in that sense. And it certainly, when we start talking about the cross, that's what it was. <clears throat> then we went to the book of Revelation, and we said that the book of Revelation is different in this respect. See how many of you remember this? That the book of Revelation is about him giving himself through his body, through us. That's what it's about. Remember that? Anybody remember that chart? Kind of. Now that I've redrawn it for you and <laughs> explained it. Now you. <laughs> anyway, so I'm only I'm only referring back to the chart now to point to this moment when I said the revelation is not the lamb on the throne, the slain lamb on the throne. The revelation is continually throughout the book the revealing of the Lamb through his people as they give themselves in death to release the same spirit that he did. Okay? All right. So I'll just read this paragraph and we'll stop. So in the book of Revelation, the only way for the inhabitants of the earth to escape, so because everybody wants to escape the horrible things in the book of Revelation or the horrible things in Romans 8 or the horrible things that happened in this, to the poor students at the Bible school or the members of New Creative Fellowship because they're part of a heathen group, pagan or whatever you will call it. The only way for the inhabitants of the earth to escape from the terrible things happening will not be by the plagues turning them from their ways. 
do, is anything going off in anybody's head? That throughout the book of Revelation, that's what we see. The plagues are kicked up and they're harder and whatever. And they're still not turning because they haven't seen the lamb. will not be by the plagues turning them from their ways, but in the same way the exodus was accomplished in the book of Exodus, by comprehending the slain lamb. That's it. That's it. That's their only hope. There is not going to be another form of escape. What about the rapture? What about it? The book of Revelation is about an unveiling. Oh, here it is. Okay, it reveals the Lamb. It's not merely revealing that there is a Lamb on the throne of the universe, but it's continually revealing the Lamb through those who bear His testimony by giving themselves. The revelation is not of end time events either, but of the Lamb revealed through these afflictions and trials. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. For example, Luke 21, 28 says something like this. And there shall be wars and rumors of wars, and there shall be this and that and this horrible thing, and da 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 da. And then it says, and when you see these things coming on the earth, look up. Don't look at them. It's so all these people that are going, oh, look at them. Oh, my God. Oh, look. Keep looking. Because this is my bread and butter. <laughs> Keep looking. Jesus said this, by the way. Look up. Okay. When, when these things happen, the Lamb will appear next. Be ready for the manifestation of his life. This is it. This is your time. This is your time. Don't miss it. See? Because that's referring, if you will, to the end time and da-da-da-da. And I'm not really talking about the end time, and I don't think Revelation is making that big of a point either. But if there is, this is how to go through it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if there is, this would be handy to know. So, you know, how, how handy would this be to you if, that, if the end time started next week? Okay. Would it be worth $500? <laughs> now I've embarrassed myself. My jokes are bad. They're horrible. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> <I can't... laughs>